This morning, we're going to have a conference presented by Dr. Stephen Fox. And uh, that is going to be commented by Rudy Yang and Joe Phillips. And uh, this panel is going to be moderated by Pablo Piñera from Chile. And uh, the rescue man. Thank you. Well, uh, I, w I want to remember you that after the, um, the conference, we're going to get on board of the buses and we're going to proceed to Sun America. Uh, it will take about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get there. And uh, there we're going to have a, a visit to the, the free zone. You will see it's very, very, a very nice place. After that, we're going to have a lunch and we're going to have a presentation uh, that uh, is going to be conducted by the CEO of Sun America. After that, we're going to return to the university and uh, uh, just after returning, we're going to uh, go directly to the paper presentation uh, sessions. I imagine that uh, all of you that are presenting papers are aware of the, or of the places where you're going to, to present your works. And in parallel to this activity, we're going to have uh, networking sessions for deans and directors and any other person interested in this kind of activities in order to foster a, a inter institutional a relationship between uh, the universities of our net. Then uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Fox to, to start with uh, his uh, presentation. Okay, uh, buenos dias. Uh, estoy encantado de estar aquí. Sorry, I was going to proceed you first. Okay. <laughs> okay, plan B. <laughs> Please. So I'm practicing my Spanish. Uh, buenos dias, estoy encantado de estar aquí y ahora seguiré en inglés, okay? Um, I hope uh, you understand my poor Spanish and um, I hope we can engage with uh, questions throughout the session um, and I'm looking forward to hearing the comments from the multiple speakers at the end. Um, what I want to talk to today is about management education as a field of reflection and action and basically, this is going to be a study of practice and practices. I wonder if it's possible to move the microphone slightly so I can see the screen. Can you still hear me? That's great. Okay, so. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, so I want to make some connections that I could see last night with the, uh, Michael Norton's talk. Um, particularly, uh, he was talking about the vocation of a business leader um, and the value of right relations with others, rights and duties with others. And the comments about the assembly line workers and the links to, say, the Braverman thesis on de-skilling of uh, assembly line workers' work uh, is part of the long march of scientific management to kind of replace humans with machines. I think that was part of um, a very nice link to my own talk, which is going to look at, uh, initially, the work of technicians working at Xerox. And uh, I'm going to study and uh, talk through um, a, a particular famous um, study by Julian Orr, who um, studied photocopy of technicians in the early, uh, late 1980s, published in 1990, 91, and uh, kept publishing throughout the 90s, and um, thanks. And um, his work is seminal, uh, but I want to, first of all, connect again with Michael Norton's talk. I think that when we look at the kind of clothing factory crises that happened in Bangladesh only last year, 
and the uh, consequences for um, the poor people there who are living uh, and working in um, very poor structurally uh, conditions and uh, the consequences for them. I think we ought to be aware of the way in which technology, which replaces people in the West and then pushes uh, craft labor and skills to other parts of the world, uh, often where the uh, health and safety regulations are not as strong, it's all part of a similar fabric. So my question, I think, is to what extent can your network facilitate the kind of study of international trading practices, and how could your network help to find allies for its mission to foster the rights and duties toward others? And I think that maybe you already know, um, I guess you've uh, connected with the critical management studies movement in general. Um, we have a wing of it in uh, the United Kingdom, and there's also a division of the American Academy of Management devoted to critical management. And I've just given you the web pages in case anybody here doesn't know them. Um, I think that um, in the critical management studies movement, which I've been party to for some time, maybe 10 or 15 years, um, we are interested increasingly in the relationship between criticality or critique and practice. Now, when, and in, this, in essence, my talk is going to be about practice and in relation to education, but more importantly, to learning. Uh, organizational learning is my field. Um, so I'm interested in the study of practical action, and I think it's still in its infancy, despite 50 years of history in this field. Um, and I would say that um, management practices uh, are increasingly a focus for research attention in fields like strategy, innovation, accounting, marketing, organizational learning, and theory. And I think uh, a good colleague of mine, Richard Whittington, um, uh, is a strategy professor down at Oxford, and he writes on the practice turn, relates that to organization research, and in this paper by, in Accounting Organization Society, he opens up the way in which strategy as a practice is now mushrooming and uh, affecting fields like marketing and so on. I want to come to management education. It's the theme of this session, which I was given, and um, I want to say thank you to Marcella uh, Mandiola in the audience at the front for having the courage to recommend me for this talk. And uh, thank you to the uh, organizers for inviting me. So management education as a field of reflection and action, debates from theory and practice. Um, I'm going to cover this broad field. How do we locate management education? I'm then going to talk about the middle bit, which will be looking at practices and talking about practices, and then the end and uh, some questions. So in this slide, which I hope you can see, um, the world of management practice is the big arc at the bottom, and it's like everything that managers do. I think in Britain we have about two and a half million managers. If you do, uh, do it pro rata for the whole world, I don't know how many millions there would be, but um, business schools like ours are generating the next generation of these managers and their practices, and we're helping to cultivate their skills and techniques and the way in which they will practice in the future. Um, and I would say that within that, the field I call management learning embraces all of that, but the field of management education over here on the right uh, is the space that we're now talking about and all of us are familiar with. Some of us, in my case, uh, are also very used, to, uh, sorry, I'm flicking the wrong button. Um, some of us are also interested in this space, um, management training and development, which is um, like management education, it's part inside the world of management practice and it's part outside of that world of management practice. We're kind of close, but not synonymous with the world of management practice. Part of the reason we are different from that world is in order to um, be able to stand back and critique that world uh, in an academic sense or as a bunch of consultants. In both cases, it's the value of critique. The, what we mean by critique is something that we might wish to dig into in a deeper way. So within uh, management and um, the field of what we call organizational learning, um, I would say that we need to focus on the relations between managing and learning. And in particular, I draw two distinctions. So underneath this slide is a kind of a two by two matrix. Um, on the one hand, we have formal and informal practices of managing and practices of learning. And at the same time, we are learning to do what? In, on the one hand, we're learning to manage. 
Uh, so, for example, in, in the top left here, um, a, a typical MBA student is formally learning to manage in the classroom. Um, on the other hand, someone on the right, informal, learning to manage, somebody in a management job but with no training, is learning to manage by doing the job. And then we also have the kind of counteracting force that learning, as universities have learned uh, over the last two decades, is something that needs to be managed increasingly. Universities cannot simply be the kind of public institutions that they were in the past, but they need to manage the process of learning. Not only do uh, organizations like universities manage learning, but large multinational organizations from the high tech end through to the less tech end is also managing their own learning. And within that, people learn to manage. So I, I wrote about that in 1994 uh, in a paper in the journal, Management Learning, if anybody wishes to follow through. If you take these permutations, there are roughly 12 permutations of managing to, managing to learn or learning to manage in these different ways, and uh, you could always look at that for um, sort of thoughts on how to study that. So I'm now coming to um, the central point, which is that when we look at formality and informality, explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge, theory and practice, the lucid and that which requires interpretation. Um, it's very easy to spot uh, the formal aspects of any organization, including management education. Um, it's kind of like a, an iceberg. You see the, the tip of the top. But underneath the sea, lots of complexity, lots of confusion, lots of secret depths, all of which need interpretation. <clears throat> I have a postdoctoral student working with me. His name is uh, Daniel Hartley. He's worked with me for nearly three years studying our students. I come from Queen Mary University of London, and it's the most diverse uh, campus in Britain, and its business school is the most diverse business school in Britain. In, and we take in many international students. Um, no one, when he looked at the pay back issues of Academy of Management Learning and Education, the Journal of Management Education, the Journal of Management Learning, the big three journals in the field of management learning, is actually studying the undergraduate experience um, in the raw. There are lots of questionnaire studies that ask them about some aspect of uh, some psychological theory for understanding their learning process, but no one is asking them directly, what is your experience? And no one is following them in the classroom like an ethnographer, following them around, watching them, seeing how they interact with not only their colleagues, their peers, but the technologies that we ask them to use, uh, perhaps the facilities of the university, like the library, the corridors, etc. So Daniel is an ethnographer, he, and he has done that piece of work. He's done two or three years of ethnographic field work with our students, and he's looking at the deeper end of the iceberg. He's not alone. Uh, his study in the world of management education is uh, a follower on, it's a successor to studies by Leven Wenger and uh, people like Shatsky, uh, Norsetina and Savigny. So these are two theoretical books on the nature of practice. And they both relate to, but especially Leven Wenger relates to practice in relation to learning. Shatsky is more interested in practice per se, with some implications for learning, but not necessarily. Um, Leif and Wenger's work drew upon five ethnographic case studies uh, from all around the world, and um, they developed a theory called situated learning theory. Julian Orr's PhD came out roughly the same time he finished his PhD in 1990. It was made famous by a paper in organization and science by Brown and Duguid, and John Seeley Brown is, uh, the, was the manager of the Xerox Park Institute um, and a key member of the top team at Xerox. So he funded the research and many more uh, pieces of work in this space. And um, Julian Orr finally produced his book in 96, and he's been writing ever since. So I'm going to start with some uh, reference to his look and his understanding of tech technicians in the context of photocopying. So um, a relatively minor example perhaps, but one that's interesting. Then I'm going to look briefly at my own work. I looked at business school classrooms back in the 1980s. I looked at Manchester Business School's executive MBA program. So I want to talk 
to, to the interactions I saw taking place in classrooms over a two-year ethnography of MBA students. These were like chief executives, company directors, lawyers, accountants, all in the classroom trying to learn about strategy, uh, human resources, and everything. And um, I'm interested in not so much how they learned those things, but more interesting how they learned from each other, with each other. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and talk about the social and moral accountability of their interactions with each other and their teachers. And then my last, um, my last case will be astronomers. If I have time to, to cover that, I'll, I'll talk about a seminal study of scientists doing their practices and discovering uh, the optically discovered pulsar, a particular kind of star. And I'll try to draw from that a certain lesson about the nature of practice and learning from practice and through practice. So, that's the plan. Uh, Julian Orr uh, wrote a, a nice paper two years after the book, Images of Work. What he's saying is that the way work gets done, when you look at it, when, and very few people actually watch what, what people do when they are working. It's a, a very small field. People like John van Marlen has done some. Uh, Stephen Barley has done some. These are famous names, and they've done ethnographic studies of technicians in action. Um, Julian Orr is in that tradition. Um, and he says that the way work gets done is observably different from the way people in responsibility talk about that work and different from the ways the organizational and business literature portray the work. So we as all management educators, we need to ask the question, do our textbooks and do our lectures actually really describe the nature of management work? Can we actually do that? Or is it, are we just referring to some world outside of our classroom? Uh, which nobody has direct access to? And why is there not a bigger literature that describes that work and all its complexity and its social problems and its uh, moral problems and the kind of issues that we were talking about yesterday? And I think that ethnographic studies is one way to do that in more depth and more detail. So Julian Orr says that ethnographic studies of, of work focus on what is actually done and more importantly, perhaps, how those doing the work make sense of their practice. And that's a very rare thing. Neither are usually part of corporate or organizational discourses about work, but the context at Xerox at the time of his study was the de-skilling of the photocopier technicians. What Xerox was trying to do was to routinize their work. So instead of allowing the photocopier technicians to work at their own pace and time, they developed a manual, an instruction manual on how they should repair photocopiers. And then Julian Orr studied how that worked in practice and found it different from the manual. So what I'm going to show you in a few minutes is um, um, a small glimpse into that piece of work by him. And the paper, Images of Work, uh, takes an example of a diagnosis in practice from his studies of field service technicians. I'm going to give you a flavor of it, and then we're going to analyze a bit of it briefly. Um, First, before I give you the flavor, uh, the situation. This is the scene. So before we get into the study, a customer has complained about the photocopier. They say it jams in a certain part of the machine. Uh, the RDH, or the recirculating document handler, is a piece of the equipment. The senior technician taking the call finds this a very believable thing and uh, re realizes that this, this particular machine has not been serviced for about a month and a half and therefore it's quite likely there's a problem. So the technician with the ethnographer, Julian Orr, uh, set off to the site in order to, uh, to, to fix the machine, but they are assuming that probably it's just a dirty machine, it needs a clean and it'll be fine. On the site, the technician asks to speak with the users of the machine in a very good, good manner, user-centered. Um, and first, they encounter the problem and the set of originals that they were trying to copy. Um, two users show up and describe the case. The transcript that follows captures something of the shared diagnosis, and I don't want you to feel you must read the whole thing. In effect, what I'm trying to show you is this is what ethnographic data looks like. Don't worry about digesting this. <laughs> um, it's too complicated, and I'll break it down. But um, what, there are things we can notice just by the blur of text on the screen. First of all, the conversation looks like it's a ramble. The transcript seems to be very dense. I think you can see that small writing, lots of it in a, a, a single slide. Um, 
technicians do not explain the problem. If you look closely, and we will do shortly, uh, they do not really explain the problem they encounter. He does, however, listen a lot and makes appreciative comments about what the users tell him. And he does not interpret out loud the things that they say, but he is doing internally. And later in excerpt three, we'll see what he says to the ethnographer when they've gone. He asks two questions and he then says thanks and okay and reassuringly he appears to understand the problem. In extract one, um, let me give you a, a feel for this. I'll read it out loud because I don't think you can read that. I was, the first user says, I was having a problem with the feeder. Uh, I didn't bring my originals with me, but I was telling Richie, the manager, that they were flat. New originals, never had staples in them or anything. I would feed them through the open, and he opens the machine cover, and one would get caught right in here. Second user, that's where mine gets caught. First user, closes the machine, and then I would have two laying on the glass. Technician repeats that, he says, two on the glass, okay. First user, two on the glass. Technician, thanks. Sounding very settled, decided, knows what's wrong. That's big input, so he's being complimentary. This is, he's getting a good story from these users. It carries on, and uh, they say more things, roughly similar, so I won't, I won't dwell on this. Uh, but then the two users leave, and the technician turns to the ethnographer, and he says, well, I narrowed her down in a hurry, saying, um, you know, as the door closes behind user number one and two. And the ethnographer says, ah, what was she pointing to? The reversing role in there? Technician, mm hmm. Uh, he's playing around with the machine, so you get in the bracket sound of the machine covers. This is, well, this is actually drives a roll. Ah, so there's sound of machine parts being wiggled. Uh, I know what's wrong. That play is not supposed to be there, says the technician. Sounds of machine parts being wiggled loudly, demonstratively, even for, the, for even the ethnographer to appreciate. So he's kind of demonstrating. It's a common, it's one of the first things that we check for. And ethnographer says, where is it maladjusted or where is it misadjusted? Where is the adjustment? It's, it's in the D shaft in back, it, and what it does, it, it's got a piece of plastic, um, a bearing that drives it. Uh -huh. Okay, and, and that flat on the D shaft, okay, wears out, and that flat on the bearing, uh, the, on the pulley, the gear gradually enlarges it. You can see the way in which this talk happens. Outside of conversation analysis and ethnomethodology narrative analysis, uh, Julian always using narrative analysis, but he's using conversation, real conversation, transcript out from an audio recording. We are getting a feel for real practices. Okay, it's not the real thing because we're transmitting it through a piece of technology and an audience miles away from the original incident. Um, it's not the real thing. It's a representation of the real thing. But we are arguing, and I am arguing, that in fact, until management studies begins to grapple with some of the details that are relevant to management practices, as well as technician practices, uh, we're not going to go as far as we'd like to go in terms of connecting with our audience managers and um, future managers and teaching and instructing them in the full complexity and subtleties of what they need to deal with. Because in the se section that we've just been seeing, there's a lot of emotional work going on between the users and the technicians and the ethnographer, they're all trying to work with each other's fragilities, sensitivities, and this is moral action in practice. It's not moral action as you might define it in terms of philosophy, but it is moral action in terms of day-to-day -day civility and kindness. And this is something that is important. Um, so the techn technician and ethnographer talking with each other in jargon. They both know something about how the machine works, could break down. They have a detailed conversation and interpretation is possible. The technician uses his hands to feel the machine. This is necessary. Without that, nothing much will work. So the kind of sense of uh, interaction with people and interaction with machines is part of this uh, depiction of practice. And he interprets the problem out loud for the ethnographer to understand, and they develop a mutual understanding. So this development of mutual understanding, I think, is at the heart of a learning process which happens in a practical context. And it's something that we can learn from. Now, in the work of Leven Wenger, some of you may know that work, uh, they make a whole theory out of learning in practice, situated learning in practice, and looking at that in context. But Julian always working in a finer level of detail, a, a, a deeper 
level of uh, smaller grain size, if you like, in order to really understand the nature of learning. So we are, I think, already in the midst of a uh, kind of a certain sort of sociological paradigm. We are not in a typical sociological paradigm, which, we, as we all know, tends to favor grand theory, grand theorizing, whether it's Marx or whether it's liberalism or whether it's neoliberalism. Uh, grand theorizing is very popular, and it gets lots of articles in top journals. Uh, but this paper, this, this, this approach is a more uh, everyday sociology, uh, a sociology of everyday life, kind of approach, and it's looking in depth and in detail. How is it different? So I want to just step back. I don't know if you know these two authors, Gibson Burrell and Gareth Morgan. Anybody? Um, yeah, it's Marcel. Yeah, thanks. Um, so they were at Lancaster, where I was for 25 years, and uh, they wrote a famous book which mapped out different perspectives on this grid, and they refined it. And since, over time, these perspectives have been added to as new perspectives come along. And if you want a list, you know, today we might have a list, something like this, which we show our uh, master students and our PhD students, this kind of list, just to help them position where their interests may be. And on this list, I've highlighted the three or four perspectives that we are now talking about. Community of practice theory, that's Laban Benger. Conversation analysis, that's ethnomethodology. Ethnomethodology itself, down here, um, uh, a kind of precursor to conversation analysis. Situated learning theory here, uh, narrative analysis, which Julian Orr is talking about. And uh, we can see some of these perspectives in action in the paper. So I want to take us a step back, and this will be an introduction to my own talk. I'm going to mention my own piece of work on MBAs classrooms, but first a little bit of background on ethnomethodology. Julian Orr is influenced by ethnomethodology. He mentions Garfinkel's work. This is Harold Garfinkel here. Harold Garfinkel studied with Talcott Parsons at Harvard in the post-war period. He draws on um, a number of different authors, um, and he came up with the idea of ethnomethodology in the 50s and the 60s. Ethnomethodology, what does it mean? The ethno means everyday, ordinary people. Um, method. I think we all know. It's how we do things. And, okay. And um, ology, the study of how we do things. So, in ethnomethodology, what we are doing is looking at uh, the study of everyday methods that people have for doing whatever it is that is important to them. And we're understanding how and how they make sense of that. His key book, 1967, is Studies in Ethnomethodology. So, these are his influences. Uh, these are people he should not be confused with, and if you want, you can look at that later. Um, here's a bunch of people that uh, influenced me. Um, Wes Sherrick, uh, John Hughes. Ethnomethodology requires a certain immersion into the practice in order to do it properly. In my case, I was a student of business, and I studied students of business. Okay, I was not a director of a firm, but I was a student of business. That enabled me to follow what the students of business were actually learning in the classroom in the way that they did. Julian Orr was not a photocopier technician, so he's not doing ethnomethodology in a pure sense, but he's influenced by that, that style of operation, and he's shadowing a technician. So he, too, is learning a lot in practice. In my case, what I found in the uh, exec MBA classroom um, through this two-year ethnographic study at Manchester Business School um, was um, a great deal of humor. And I've, I've published that. One of my first papers was in sociology on the nature of humor in an MBA classroom. And I've looked subsequently at other aspects of it. I would click to the, uh, sorry, again, uh, this, this paper at the bottom uh, in organization studies. That miracle of uh, familiar organizational things, social and moral order in the MBA classroom. That's a recent study paper based on the original work. And what I would say is that, leaving aside the quote you can read later, um, social and moral order is a practical accomplishment for people in real time, in real settings. For members, ordinary facts of life are moral facts of life, through and through. And this is a key comment from Garfinkel and the uh, approach that ethnomethodology adopts. So social order 
practical order, moral order, they're kind of like different layers of the same thing or different facets of the same thing. You cannot separate them out. It's not that practice is separable from moral order or from social order. It's intertwined with all of these things. And we have no way of stepping outside of our language to talk about language. At the same time, we have no way of stepping outside of the moral order in order to talk about the moral order. Indeed, we cannot get out of practice to talk about practice. So these referential and reflexive processes are key to the way in which we study the nature of management practices. So um, critique, I want to talk briefly about critique and criticality. Traditionally, critique is heavy theoretical stuff. It might require deep readings of Kant or Marx or someone famous. Um, reflection and reflexivity are methodological requirements uh, for critique. You know, Kant and Marx are definitely reflexive people. Um, and criticality. And uh, these reflection and reflexive processes take place outside of the action as a reflection upon the action, at a distance to it, even exogenous to it, possibly transcendent to it. But for ethnomethodology and for the whole sociology of everyday life, reflexivity is endogenous. It's imminent in everyday practical action. So everyday practical action is reflexive from the start. Nobody does anything in the real world, so to speak, without thinking about it. And we shouldn't imagine that our theory is a better way of uh, making sense of it than their own account of it. And that's why we would do this kind of study and look at it in close detail. So I would say that coming out of that is a different conception of learning. Instead of seeing learning as something that we do entirely as individuals in a classroom, making sense and digesting uh, the content that the lecturer is trying to convey, instead, learning comes through a common understanding which is acquired. It's not just shared knowledge that you know, the teacher has a set of um, criteria and they assess our understanding of that um, according to their criteria. Instead, a conversation takes place in a classroom, a, a conversation takes place around a photocopier machine or in, in several other contexts. And that is a process of dialogue and achieving mutual understanding which is emergent within the expectations of everyday life. And it's a moral and um, enforceable character in, in, in terms of its social significance for members. So in my case, I'm following in a tradition of phenomenological studies of natural learning by Burgoyne and Hodgson at Lancaster. I'm applying ethnomethodology to MBA classrooms. And um, in this class, what we see is a particular case by, an inter by a teacher on the nature of international trade. And he's trying to convey some key points about international trade. And I'm going to end after this case. I won't go on to the third case. And uh, we'll close down uh, with a few summaries and some points. I want to bring out a few points from this, uh, the extracts coming up. So uh, the key thing is, in this situation, the teacher does not realize, but I do, because I'm sitting in the class with the students, that none of them have done the case overnight. They should have done their homework. They should be in class ready to talk about it with the teacher. None of them have done it. They've been busy on something else. They are now trying to cover up the fact that they have not done their homework, and they're going to do that by distracting the lecturer with all kinds of uh, humor, jokes, banter, and so on, which we get in the, in the class. The teacher asks a question about the nature of international trade, and we get this extract, which I'll just read through. One of them says, um, he's asking, what is the nature of an international contract. Um, so this occasions some humor about contracts in general. Contracts are entered, into gentle, entered by gentlemen will sooner or later be executed by knaves. So there's laughter at that. But isn't this true of all relationships with great respect, says Nick. Laughter, pause, even in marriage, laughter. Okay, Nick, just because we didn't all go to Cambridge, laughter. Uh, appealing to the lecturer, Nick says, I was trying not to be personal. Um, as soon as someone says about him, as soon as he says, with great respect, you know, and the teacher says, yes, start ducking when anybody says this. It's just like um, if someone says that's interesting, you know they're going to say, I think we had that joke last night. Um, so, so they pull the face. And this interaction is really teaching us something about the moral order of an MBA classroom, the way in which this is banter and joking. It's doing work. It's not just banter and joking. It's doing the cover-up work 
to hide the fact that the students haven't done much homework. It's moral work, e.g., for example, it involves showing off, putting others down, mocking some people. It's interacting, uh, formulating four different kinds of wrongdoing, and they're formulating it as wrongdoing in the talk, like the, the crime of being personal, class-based mockery of Nick, who's... Um, didn't, did his studies in Cambridge, uh, being inauthentic and being disrespectful. All of that is there in a small segment of conversational data um, this long. And uh, all of that can be teased out in, in depth and in detail. Now, I think that we could step back from it. You, you might wonder, why do we want to go into such detail about the nature of practice? What is the point? Um, isn't it something we can all, we all assume we, we all know details like this, but what's the point of studying it? I would say that the, the value of studying it is in order to make sense of particular interactions that matter. So one of my colleagues, uh, Samra Fredericks, has studied a boardroom context in a large company, and they, they are allocating blame amongst each other around the boardroom table, and that is germane to the strategy of the future organization the uh, career prospects of the members around the table. One guy loses his job as a consequence of a short conversation around a boardroom table. I think that once we take the method and apply it to uh, strategy, to innovation, to the, the big topics of organization theory, and management studies, business studies, then we can find a way to connect with the audience in all their sophistication in terms of the moral and social problems that they face in interaction with each other and with their equipment, their technologies, whether it's email or, or Facebook. And uh, this is the value of this kind of research. And I would say that management learning as a field is moving in this direction. People like Sylvia Gerardi and uh, Richard Whittington, et cetera, are taking this approach, applying it to organization learning, to strategy, and so on. And therefore, I commend it to you and hope you find it of some interest. Thank you very much. Well, we thank Dr. Fox for the excellent presentation. And uh, uh, I will invite our uh, uh, panel that will comment. I will invite uh, Rudy Yang to take his place. I will invite uh, Pablo Pineda to lead the, the action. I will invite as well as Joe Phillips to comment the presentation. Now our support team is going to provide them with Max. And I will let you know that we are going to change a bit the procedure for the questions. Uh, we will prefer you to raise a hand if you want to make a, a question. And our support staff is going to provide you with, with a microphone. OK? Well, and I remember you, as uh, I already said, that finished this activity, 10.30. We are going to get on board of the uh, buses that uh, are going to lead us to Sun America. And we're going to spend the rest of the morning over there, having a very, very good time. I'm sure you, you will enjoy it. Professor Rudy Ang de la Ateneo Manila University, and the Joseph Phillips de San Peter University. 
Cada uno tendrá 10 minutos para su intervención y posteriormente recibiremos preguntas del público. Quiero dejar con la palabra al profesor Rudy Ank por 10 minutos, por favor. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Fox, for your presentation. There's a lot of uh, content there. I thought I'd just focus on two main areas as it might affect the way we teach our classes. Um, the first is about the students. I thought um, reading a little about the work you've already done in terms of situated learning and action learning I thought I'd make the distinction between the way we handle our undergraduate classes and the way we handle our graduate level classes. So the problem for undergraduate level students is that uh, they're imagining what a CEO might do without actually knowing what a CEO might do. And so they focus on theory and not so much on actual practice. But the graduate students are the reverse. Our own graduate students are mostly part-time students. So oftentimes, they're just like the students you described in Manchester. They come without having done the readings, and they cover up. But the, the, the point is that they are more action-oriented, more experiential in their sharing, and less on theory. And so our approach to both has to be different. And I'm not sure that we're always different in the way we approach both. Yesterday, I had a conversation with our colleague from Boston College, and she said, teaching business ethics to undergraduate students, the problem with the cases that she used with them at first is that each case asked them to imagine what they would do if they were CEO of a company. And yet, undergraduate freshmen would have no idea what they would do as a CEO of a company until she started using cases with them that were covering things that were within the realm of experience. So then they could relate business ethics to everyday experiences and know what, how they would behave as opposed to how they think people would behave. So how do we bring more of this situational learning and action learning into the classroom? Uh, most of our schools are doing simulation and case method, but a lot of the way we respond to the case method is about how we think we should respond. Maybe not exactly how we would actually respond in the situation. So then we move to other types of activities like practicum, immersion, experiential learning, uh, service learning activities. But the problem, I think, for us is that they do the experience and perhaps when they come back, we don't do enough in terms of processing processing their experiences. And your presentation is about not just doing, but processing and understanding maybe the subtext of what has happened. So we send our students to practicum and say, they'll pick up things, they'll learn things. And we assume that they will learn things, but how often do we bring them back to the classroom and talk to them about what they've seen, what they've heard, what they said, and what they heard other people saying. So I think... Uh, this whole idea of experiential learning, situation learning, action learning, action practice. Sometimes we err on the side of too much theory and no action. Other times we err on the side of action and not enough uh, reflection on that. The second idea I have is about the faculty development. Our business schools often have a lot of part-time faculty and a lot of full-time faculty. And the problem with your approach when I look at your approach there, is that our full-time faculty might focus on theory and less on practice, while our part-time faculty sometimes say, this is the way it is in the real world, and then uh, forget about what you learned in your books. And so even the way they handle the classes, I thought your example on Manchester, the faculty member showed poor ability to assess what was going on in the classroom. And I think full-time faculty with more training in how to manage the class might have a better sense of all these little tricks that students play. 
But part-time faculty, on the other hand, might have less of that, but more of the practice. So the kind of faculty development activities we need to put together are going to have to be different for our full-time as well as for our part-time faculty. I, I, those are the two main points that I wanted to emphasize. I know Joe will have uh, other points that he'd want to talk about. Hard to add much to what Rudy's already said, of course, but Dr. Fox, thank you for your remarks. I'm sorry we didn't get to some of your other examples that you were hoping to do. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, experiential education is becoming much more um, part of business education. Um, and not, not just at the graduate level, but at the undergraduate level. And, and I see not only the faculty in my schools, but other schools looking at all kinds of different ways to bring that into the process. And part of it is just, you know, the younger generation doesn't put up with lectures anymore. You're not going to be a successful faculty member if that's what you try to do. Um, so things are getting much more applied. So uh, we're pushing students to do internships harder now than we did 10 years ago, for example. Uh, we are not just doing uh, tried and true techniques like case studies, but we're actually going to businesses and getting them to give us projects for teams of students to work on. Uh, we're making much more use of guest speakers coming in and talking about you know, real stories that they can convey to, to students. For example, Rudy mentioned undergraduate students don't have as much context as graduate students would be, so we're, we're constantly trying to figure out ways to get around that issue and make it more applied and make it um, more experiential. Um, what I was struck by uh, in listening to your comments was uh, how it ties to Ignatian pedagogy, which is a, a topic that I'm not an expert on, but I'm sure somebody in this crowd is. But, you know, Ignatian pedagogy is sort of a five-step process to how we educate students at Jesuit universities and Jesuit high schools. Um, the first part is the context is about, you know, where is the student coming from? And this gets to some of the comments uh, Rudy said in terms of undergrad versus graduate. But a second, the second step is experiential. You know, so not just lecturing at students, but getting them to experience something as part of their educational process. And, um, you know, I was just struck by how your work kind of feeds into that educational process that we use at uh, Jesuit universities. Uh, the second thing that I thought about was, um, you know, some of the schools that are in our meeting today are work with uh, AACSB International, the accrediting body, and um, I think AACSB has also been pushing schools to have a more experiential uh, approach to education. And uh, some of the new em points of emphasis at AACSB around things like engagement, engagement with the business community, uh, is, you know, getting going to the business community for practical, applied examples to give to students is part of engagement in my mind and lines up very nicely with what you are talking about when you were bringing that down to business education. Um, I think it also there's another trend at ACSB around the impact. So what is the impact of what our business schools are having across the board in terms of students, on society, on business practice. And again, if we take this applied approach, we're having more impact on our students. And if they're doing some good things in uh, some of the projects that they're working on for businesses, for example, there's impact on the community. So um, it's interesting to me how that lines up with those two things. And then the final point of emphasis is around innovation. Well, of course, I think we're constantly innovating the way we're educating our students. And to take this more experiential uh, approach, I think, is, is completely in line with that. So those were a couple of uh, reflections I had as I listened to uh, some of the things you were talking about. Can I start with one question for Dr. Fox? 
on your case on the Manchester Business School, I feel as if there's a second part that's missing that maybe can fill us in. So you observe this going on. What do you propose should happen next? So can, I, can you hear me with this? Okay. Um, well, first of all, could I just say that I, I agree with many of the things you said about um, the uh, implications of this kind of work for uh, the difference between undergraduate and postgraduate. So I agree with that distinction. Um, and I, I think that we, all of us are today making good use of internships and exercises, simulations, and many other things to gain a certain level of practice in a classroom. Um, I think that if you go right back to answer your question about the executive MBA program back in the 80s, you know, I'm sure things have changed a lot since then. Um, for example, at that time we did not have the internet. Um, we, we did not have email even. So um, the whole thing has changed. I think that um, what I'm suggesting is that if you think about management education as a part of a wider movement of management learning, organizational learning, it's, uh, we are finding that there are ways of researching the learning process in the company, in the corporation, in the organization, in the charity, in the public sector institution. And that's where interesting work can take place in terms of research. And of course, you can send your master's students and your PhD students into those environments and come back with traveler's tales that tell us uh, details about what that practice is. If we're simply sending uh, undergraduates on an internship, I think in that case, you're right, that more debriefing of that experience is essential to get the best value from it. But the key question for me is, how do we even think about learning? I think that the, the process of learning uh, understood in a typical university business school is still rather cognitivist in its fundamental assumptions. You still have to teach a certain body of statistics, a certain body of quantitative method, a certain body of strategy. The history hangs heavy on our shoulders. And of course we need to do that to get AACSB accreditation because there is a syllabus and it's a universal or a worldwide syllabus and each business school is under pressure to conform to that syllabus. But I think therefore the real import of, of the, the paper that I've presented is in a way, I don't think I made it as clear as I would have liked to do, uh, is to step back a little bit from these big machines of quality control that basically uh, reinforce a curriculum and reinforce a syllabus which we could question. And I think that already with the kind of practices you've both referred to and uh, which I'm familiar with, um, is beginning to fragment the nature of what can we actually teach? What quantity of content can we really get across? And of course, there is a limit on certain particular fields, like accounting, very much in uh, debt to the professional bodies of accounting, and therefore there's not much room for maneuver. But there's a constant struggle between the professional bodies and the curriculum. I'm working increasingly with HR people. In Britain, we have one of the larger um, professional bodies of human resource management on the planet uh, with lots of people signed up to uh, become professional uh, HR m managers. And um, that dictates to a certain degree the, the syllabus for us. And it limits the amount of criticality we might get into that syllabus. So I think that business schools need to step back and therefore there needs to be a research program which actually addresses have we got the balance of um, experience and theory and content right, or is it actually out of kilter, out of balance? I think that's a question, and I'm not sure who's really addressing that as a global question. I think it's uh, overdue. I think that there are lots of papers filling the journals of the Academy of Management Learning and Education, my own journal, Management Learning, and Journal of Management Education. Um, but taking that gestalt view of the, the field, I think that's something that's desirable. I don't know if I answered your question now. So as specifically related yes. to the Manchester Business School example, okay. what is the conclusion of that case? What is the? What is the conclusion of that conclusion. case? Uh, the conclusion is that the executive program continues to be a very serious, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a faculty member there anymore, and um, 
that was some time ago, but from my friends and associates over, over there, uh, I understand the executive program is still very important to them. Um, the Manchester uh, Business School had um, a model of education which they called project learning. Uh, so it's always quite focused on designing projects for master students to do, um, usually in a group uh, within the uh, business school and sometimes in, in a client organization. And I think that's still, still the, the case. I think that the real implication of the study is how do they think about the process of designing MBAs and refinements to the uh, programs in the light of this kind of uh, analysis? Thank you very much, Professor Eng. Thank you very much, Professor Jefferson. Philips, please, now we are going to receive questions from the audience. Please. Hola. Sí. My name is Joan Lee. I'm an accounting professor in the States, and I'd like to challenge something you just said. Um, you said in the area of accounting, there isn't much room to hmm. do anything. There isn't much room to do anything beyond theory, and I think that is what got us into trouble in accounting to begin with. I think we have to teach critical thinking in accounting, and if the, the theory can be learned, um, to use Mike's model yesterday. Sorry, I can't hear, I can't hear what you said, actually. Um, may I come closer, then I could maybe hear you? Is it okay? I don't know who's hearing me and who's not. If you just speak Hold a bit slower. Okay, Thanks. okay. Um, I think in accounting, the way we got into trouble is by not teaching critical thinking. Yeah. And I think that to think that an area that's very theory-bound, you can avoid doing that, is a real error. I think we have to push the students harder. Mike said yesterday we're, that we wouldn't design a model where we wouldn't use, you know, the full capacity. We're not using the full capacity when we're only teaching theory to accounting students. So you're saying we should be more critical? Much more. I agree with you entirely. I'm sorry if I give you the wrong impression. <laughs> That's my answer to that one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Shuparna. I teach international business uh, at Xavier. So, um, Stephen, learning happens in the context of culture. Yeah. It also happens in the context of hierarchies. Yes. Racial gender, yeah. all sorts of hierarchies. Now, I want you to expand your notion of learning. How do you see this unfolding in a global organization, which is very messy, which is very fraught with all sorts of tensions, you know, and so just, it, it almost appeared to me that, you know, it was a very neutral rendering of learning, which mm -hmm. I'm sure is not. No. But if you could expand on, on learning as a process which is embedded in this hegemony, you know, in, in, you know the dominant hegemony, English as a language, mm, mm. if you could expand on that. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I completely agree uh, that we have a very fragmented and diverse and uh, multifaceted uh, population of students and staff increasingly. Um, and in effect, what you're calling for is a kind of post-colonial approach to management education. This is something that we are trying to develop at Queen Mary uh, University of London. And um, we are thinking in terms of how to do that. So we have a student body, which is very diverse. We have a staff body, which is very diverse. Um, yes, we teach in English. It is an English institution. I, won't, I can't, can't cross that one. Um, but I think that through internships abroad and so on, we could get past that to a degree. And uh, it comes back to issues of how do you debrief the learners when they come back. I don't think we've got there yet. I think that's the direction of travel. And I think that um, this is not an answer. You know, I don't have a, I'm not trying to provide answers for business schools on how they should develop a post-colonial syllabus or post-colonial set of methods. But I think that is the direction we ought to be going in. Um, and then I'm, I'm thinking, well, how do we do the research that helps us to understand the differences that matter, uh, which, as you rightly say, are, are uh, gendered and raced and classed and all the rest of the different sociological categories that we tend to use. I think the point of my talk today is to say that 
you know, I am a member of the critical community signed up and I would agree with those categories as, as being very important. But I think one thing gets missed in those sociological categories and that is the kind of sense-making that ordinary people do, which is often as subtle as the sociologists, maybe more so. And when you look at their work and their thinking, their feeling, actually we could do more of that and it wouldn't hurt us. And I'm all for critical management studies, critical counting and the rest. But uh, let's have some studies that actually look at the practices that there is, are a consequence of their interactions with the real world. This next question will be in Spanish. Okay. Can we come to that? Okay. Just a second. I'm going Just a second. Eh? Un two, two microphones. <laughs> I'm on. Yeah. 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 It's okay. Por favor. Sí, hola. Eh, José Prato, de la Universidad Católica del Uruguay. Nos, eh, voy a hacer un, comen un comentario uniendo la exposición del doctor Fox y el doctor Phillips. Eh, nosotros hemos instrumentado un plan de estudios desde el año 2013, eh, pensando fuertemente en esa lógica que nos planteaba el doctor Phillips, de que eh, los alumnos ya no resisten, se aburren, en clase y no resisten las ponencias magistrales de los, de los docentes. Y hemos introducido, entre otras cosas, eh, el trabajo en equipo, muy fuertemente el trabajo en equipo de, de los alumnos. Y me pareció sumamente interesante eh, su exposición sobre la endometología y me, parece, me parecía sumamente interesante y me gustaría su opinión eh, si es posible el trabajo de, de esa rama de la ciencia en el trabajo eh, de poder meterse, introducirse en los equipos para ver qué dicen los estudiantes. Ya no qué dicen los estudiantes del docente magistral, sino qué dicen los estudiantes entre ellos mismos. Nosotros tenemos equipos conformados en forma heterogénea, son equipos de cinco estudiantes, y me parece sumamente interesante cómo interactúan esos estudiantes en forma crítica, ¿eh? Eh, las clases se han hecho muy interactivas, realmente eh, ya los estudios nos dicen que aprenden mucho más que de una clase magistral porque son pares y los pares escuchan mucho más que a un docente que lo ven asimétrico. ¿eh? Entonces me gustaría ver su opinión porque me parece sumamente atractivo el planteo que nos ha hecho. Muchas gracias, doctor. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, um, I would say that Yes, part of the study we've been, part of the study which we did in uh, Queen Mary over the last two years included a master student who did a, an ethnography. She's from, uh, Lahore, uh, I think, Lahore in uh, Pakistan, and she did a, a very nice ethnographic study of some undergraduates studying on the undergraduate program. And so she was following them into the library where they met to swap stories and tell each other how they got out of bed that morning and what they've been watching and then what do you think of that exam that we've got to do and wasn't the teacher asking for too much or was it too little? Um, what did she mean by this concept? And they were helping each other. So we captured that, not on, not on tape, but she wrote down field notes in real time and hung out with that group of students for a, a, a period of time. Um, so I think that it is possible, but actually it's not possible for... Um, Teachers like myself at my age, and um, maybe some of you could pass, you know, as a student, but it's not possible for me. And that's why I work with a, a PhD, former PhD student who's now doing a postdoc, and he's able to participate with uh, the students and a, a master's student who can also do the same thing. And what's great is that the undergraduates gain something from having an observer over there um, so that they recognize that A, the, the institution is actually is taking an interest in their learning, even though it's not the syllabus, but it's kind of what they do in their social life and in the library and in, in such subgroups. I think that's very important. So I think it's important for our students that they realize that they are, um, it's as important for us to research them as it is to research senior managers. Um, I think that the, the learning that they get from it was really, what we learned through the ethnographic study, the small piece, was um, the way in which Um, students can ask each other questions that they dare not ask in class. It sounds obvious, I guess we all know this, that students get worried about the uh, 
concepts, did they understand it, or the, the challenges that they're given? Could they really do that assessment? They don't know how to approach it. A few words with some friends, and everything gets easier. So then the question becomes, I think, um, anticipating uh, your, your thoughts, perhaps. Uh, what, does, what does the business school do about that? I think one of the things it does, uh, as we did, I was in Sydney for about two or three years before I came to London, working in a business school at University of Technology in Sydney. And there we put, put a lot of effort into the built environment, the, uh, the, the corners of the faculty, the corridors. We put sofas in there, we put um, computers, PCs, we curtained off corners that people could use, students could get in there, work in groups, talk to each other, share, and um, treat the whole space as if it's their own front room, basically. And that was very important for the student body, it made them feel valued by the institution. But I think even more important, if I may say, um, is this kind of concept that ethnographic work is, is um, actually valuable because of the detail, which can get lost on the statisticians amongst us. Um, when, when you look at uh, the detail in an ethnographic report, you wonder where is the generalization? Um, and I th think that the kind of answer to that is, 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 I mean, I face it with my students and I would say, like yourself, I also manage teamwork with first year undergraduates and we get them working in teams and, and we follow them about and we see what they can do and uh, how they can do projects together and how they can present those projects back to an, a larger audience of their fellow students. And that seems to be very effective in teaching them something. I'm not sure what exactly, but you know, I wouldn't like to define the skills that they walk away with, but it does include working and interacting with other people. But I don't assess that part. I'll let them assess it. Um, Andre Habisch, I'm teaching business ethics. I'm a theolog theologian and economist uh, teaching business ethics at the Catholic University yeah. in Germany. And uh, we do this, we teach um, ethical topics and contents in our organizations under the heading of business ethics or corporate social responsibility or sustainability or so. And I ask myself, I mean, this is all rather doctrine doctrinational approach, yeah? mm -hmm. so with the idea that we have some knowledge as theorists, yeah, as ethics specialists, which we then have to kind of uh, put on the practice or, or, or help uh, students to, um, to uh, in their further uh, career, uh, kind of implement in the practice. But um, in the light of your very inspiring ethnographic uh, approach shouldn't we not better teach these topics under the heading of practical wisdom yeah which practical wisdom and management yeah which is uh, a lot of uh, based on this uh, knowledge that practitioners already have a lot of ethics inside especially small and medium mm. companies yeah have a lot of ethics in place otherwise the institution will probably not run sustainably and uh, i think also in the light of the paper um, which we, um, uh, which Mike introduced yesterday, yeah, of, of the vocation of the business leader. I think this also this would be approach, especially in, in Catholic institutions, which uh, well comes or sets on the on the on the tradition, yeah, but also links very nicely with these kind of approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I took that to be um, a general. Uh, applause for the idea of phronesis or uh, practical wisdom and I would agree <laughs> was there a question <laughs> yes thanks yeah, question, please. Hello. Hello. Sí. Bueno, mi nombre es eh, José Arauz de la okay. BUSE, la Pontificia yeah. Universidad. Un momento, por favor. Sorry. Please. Mi nombre es José Arauz de la de la Pontificia Universidad Católica del Ecuador. Eh, yo desempeño un cargo administrativo, eh, que es una dirección de bienestar estudiantil, algo parecido al medio universitario, es decir, buscar que los estudiantes tengan salud, cultura, deportes y bolsa de empleo, que es una nueva actividad, tratar de incluir a nuestros estudiantes en las empresas a través de prácticas y pasantías. Por otro lado, desempeño una cátedra en la Facultad de Negocios de Administración 
eh, Administración Global y otra Marketing Deportivo, que son grupos de estudiantes, los unos menores, Marketing Deportivo ya mayores, algo así como una especialización. Pero, eh, ¿cómo haría, la pregunta sería, cómo haríamos para como universidad, como docentes, llegar a las grandes empresas para que haya inclusión en nuestros estudiantes. Ecuador es un país pequeño, una economía dolarizada, con un porcentaje alto de gente pobre, eh, indígenas, afrodescendientes, pero como tal vez eh, tendencia de país, estamos trabajando en la inclusión de esas personas, inclusión a un sistema de educación superior. Y Dios nos bendijo a través de la visita del Papa Francisco, tanto a la universidad como una reunión con los religiosos, que habló de temas de, de inclusión y de gratuidad. Es decir, que muchos que tenemos la suerte de haber estudiado seamos recíprocos con el pobre, con el joven, con el indígena, eh, que recibimos de la gracia, de la educación, de la capacitación, que no seamos muy exigentes en cobrar, en, en siempre ser, eh, buscar retribución de dinero, sino que seamos eh, hermanos de ese, de ese prójimo, de, ese, de esa gente pobre, de ese, de ese joven con pocos recursos que para nosotros está claro, pero ¿cómo haríamos para llegar a las grandes empresas, a las multinacionales, a, a gente que, que puede manejar la posibilidad de dar o no pasantías a nuestros estudiantes? ¿Cuál sería el, el, ese mensaje? Es decir, de, de este cambio del mundo, de ver por el que menos tiene, eh, tomar, alguien dijo, de la pedagogía ignaciana de, de, las, de las universidades de la Compañía de Jesús. Pero, ¿cuál sería la estrategia? La pregunta al señor Fox. Gracias. Okay, this was the last uh, question, huh? Please. Okay, that's a question I asked you. <laughs> I asked that question of you when I first arrived and started my talk. I was asking, what can your group, this network of 400 Jesuit business schools, what can it do? It can leverage more than uh, me personally and most institutions as an individual institution. So, I think the, the answer is probably networking. And a networked um, group of institutions has more leverage um, than a single institution. So I'd like to see ways of building connections. And I think that's why I mentioned the uh, critical management studies movement in America and in the United Kingdom and, of course, of course throughout Europe. Um, that, that movement is a, a way that uh, we could join forces to uh, develop ways of leveraging our net influence on the corporate sector. I also think that business schools, you know, we charge a lot, you know. Why don't we find ways of developing scholarships uh, for those who are less able to pay? And of course, before you get to business school, uh, there could be um, programs, uh, diplomas, certificates, at a lower level as an alternative to the, the education system or in complementary terms to the education system. So lots of things to do before Um, we invite the poor people you're describing straight into a business school, perhaps with no uh, preparation appropriately. So I think it's a mixed response, I think, but I think that the essential thing is to network and to ensure that we, we c develop. I think we need to develop a, a debate on the future of management education, future of management learning, how learning goes on in this world, and how we can leverage our influence to get the kind of um, internships that you're describing for the people that you think need it. And I, I tend to agree with you with that. I don't think it's, I can't give you a, a complete answer, but I think networking. Well, like always, time is over. Thank you very much, Professor Fox, Thank you. Professor Hang, and Professor Phillips. Thank you. Well, now, before uh, finishing with this activity, I would like to give a present to our uh, uh, excellent Palan. First of all, I would like to give a small present to Dr. Stephen Fox. Please, doctor, over here, over here. It's, it's one surprise after another. <laughs> Thank you very much.
As well, I would like to give a present to Mr. Rudy Ang. Another present for uh, uh, Joe Phillips. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for Pablo Piñera. Ah, for you. Of course, for you too. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. Dear friends, please remember that the buses are waiting for us just outside of the main entrance of the university. We have a few minutes to get on board. Please proceed directly to the buses, then we can uh, keep our timing. Do not forget that at the exit of this room, there is a table with printed schedules for the networking activities. All of you that are interested in networking, please help yourself, pick up a schedule, and let's go to the buses. Thank you.